There is no symbol of military might greater than the aircraft carrier. With their ability to project air power globally, stand at the helm of vast and apocalyptically powerful naval formations, and also serve as floating military bases, they represent a power and capability that simply can't be matched by any other piece of military hardware. As a result of this, any nation that wishes to windmill its military might on the global stage is desperate to get their hands on one, or ideally several of them, and today we shall be gaining a wider appreciation of exactly what it is such nations actually strive to get their hands on by taking a look at four of history's most powerful aircraft carriers from right at the very genesis through to the modern day. So let's jump in. Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to tell you about our fantastic sponsor, Keeps. Now, look, as you can all probably tell, I know a thing or two about male pattern baldness. My hair ran for the hills about 10 years ago, and it's not coming back. However, I'm pretty confident that if I had Keeps back in the day when things just started getting a bit smooth and shiny, it might have been a different story. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for guys like me to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their home. That's right, no inconvenient trips to the doctor's office or pharmacy that take time out of your schedule. You simply order in online and it's delivered directly to your door at whatever time you decide is convenient. And on top of that, it's affordable, typically half the cost of traditional pharmacy prices. Keeps offers clinically proven treatments. According to studies, these treatments are 90% effective for treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. Plus, they have a two-in-one gel that's like a superhero for your hair. Most Keeps customers notice results within six months of starting treatments. And in addition to great treatments, Keeps also offers hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade. So not only can they help stop your hair loss, but they can make your hair look awesome. All things that I wish I could do. I wish Keeps had been around 10 years ago because, uh, yeah. To date, Capes have helped nearly 1 million men keep their hair with over 4,500 five star reviews from satisfied customers. Plus, the delivery arrives, it's non branded, so discretion is the name of the game here. No need to be embarrassed. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash Simon or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon. And now back to today's video. In what is probably quite the subversion of your expectations, our first carrier of interest today was actually an ocean liner. Well, sort of, let me explain. The ship in question was the Conte Rosso, an Italian ocean liner that was laid down at William Beardmore Shipyard in Scotland in 1914. All was going swimmingly with her construction until a Serbian fellow shot an Austrian bloke in Sarajevo, and as a result, the world descended into war. After this, Britain, eager to continue ruling the waves as it did in those days, duly started plundering its shipyards for anything that floated, which it could requisition, bung a white ensign on it, and push it into military service. This process naturally brought the then half finished Conte Rosso into their custody, but, well, what to do with it? It was no good finishing her as intended and making use of her as a troop transport. They were already knee deep in them after they requisitioned the entire civil marine fleet, and further to that, sticking some guns on her to make her a traditional warship, well, That'd be pretty stupid. She was a civilian liner. Her hull afforded about as much protection as a wet paper bag. But there was no need to despair, because while the Conte Rosso might have appeared to be pretty useless to the outside observer, she actually gave the Royal Navy exactly what it needed. An opportunity. Specifically, an opportunity to prototype a new idea that they had been mulling over on the cheap. An entire ship dedicated to nothing but operating and supporting aircraft. Such an idea wasn't actually new, but prior efforts have been a bit well, lacking, to say the least. We're talking ships like HMS Manica, a balloon carrier that could chuck a few balloons into the air. It's exciting stuff we know. And HMS Engadine, a seaplane tender, i.e. a cargo ship with a crane that could dump seaplanes into and recover them from the water. And bodged protocarriers like the HMS Hibernia, normal warships that had a bit of a flat stuck on the back of them to be able to launch a couple of planes, but had to recover them out of the drink with a crane. But the Conte Rosso, or H HMS Argus, as it would be known in Royal Navy service, well, she was to be a proper aircraft carrier like how we imagine them today, with a full-length flight deck that allowed normal wheeled aircraft to take off and land. With a displacement of about 14,500 long tons at standard load, a length of 565 feet and a beam of 68 feet and a draft of 23 feet, she was just a tad smaller than the supercarriers of today, as we'll see later in today's video. And with a top speed of 20.5 knots, courtesy of her Parsons steam turbines, she was 
quite a bit slower too. In terms of guns, she had six four-inch guns, which are pea shooters in the grand scheme of things, fit only for anti-aircraft and fast boat defense. But fortunately, they were just secondary. Her real teeth came from the 18 aircraft that she stored in her hull. Now, this might not sound too great all in all, but for her time, her capabilities were absolutely revolutionary and simply cannot be overstated. She was commissioned in September 1918, far too close to the war's end to see combat, and so she ended up becoming a kind of extended and long-lived prototype and proof of concept ship. She was still a service vessel, make no mistake, and would have been called up had anything kicked off big style in the 1920s, but nothing did. And so it was a life of tinkering and testing for her with every, and we mean every, aircraft type the Royal Navy could get its hands on being flown off and on her time and time again in order to help the Navy's boffins get their head around the specifics of how best to use a carrier. Everything from tiny Sopwith Stratas right up to giant Vickers Vimmies. So, come World War II, carrier technology had had raced ahead, which left Arga somewhat lacking compared to her younger sibling. But with the dynamics of the conflict demanding that every asset at Britain's disposal play its part, Argus would finally see a combat debut when she provided air cover for the supply convoy headed to Malta during Operation Harpoon in 1942 while carrying a belly full of fairy fulmars and swordfishes. She would also see combat again in Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of French North Africa that same year. She performed well enough there, sending the odd Axis bomber into the sea as and when, but that was about it. She was a valuable asset, to be sure, but the unfortunate reality was that she was simply too old to keep up with the big girls of the 1940s. As a result of all of this, then, Argus's fate was ultimately somewhat bittersweet. She was an absolute unit in her day. That day just so happened to be a peaceful one that didn't send her to war. Despite all of that, however, as the mother of all later carriers, she more than earned her place in this video. All right, let's open this section with some controversy. We think the USS Enterprise was, hands down, the single best carrier of World War II. She was the single most decorated ship of the war, period, receiving a total of 20 battle stars for her various escapades therein. A battle star being a commendation issued to US Navy warships for meritorious participation in battle or for having suffered damage during battle. Commissioned in 1938, Enterprise was second of the Yorktown class, a class of three carriers built right in that late interwar and early World War II period when aircraft carriers were really starting to come into their own. Their vast and infinitely mobile air arms, with the ability to reach out and strike literally anywhere, finally and fully realizing the aspirations of the early carrier pioneers of 20 years prior. As for a design, that was a product of the limitations imposed by the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, which sought to prevent an arms race in naval construction and imposed a displacement limit of 27,000 tons. As a result, Enterprise hit the sea with a displacement of give or take 25,000 tons, which for comparison is about half of the indomitable battleship Bismarck and roughly 10% the displacement of a modern cruise ship. Far from being a detriment, however, this proved to be exactly the pressure the US Navy needed to forge a diamond, as it forced nautical engineers to really think about how they used the space that they did have and not let a single inch of deck go to waste. They simply incorporated every advanced technology that they could get their hands on to maximize the efficient use of space within the craft. As a result of this, Enterprise could squeeze up to 90 aircraft within an 827-foot-long hull, a terrifying prospect for any Japanese sailor. And speaking of Enterprise facing Japanese sailors, let's now talk about her gallant war record. From the outbreak of World War II, Enterprise was on point for the US Navy's engagement in the Pacific Theater. It was her planes that sank the first Japanese submarines of the conflict, I-70 to be precise, just three days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. More generally, in the critical early months of the war, when the American fleet was still reeling from the devastation wrought at Pearl Harbor, Enterprise provided crucial air support for the beleaguered American forces participating in raids on the Marshall Islands and vital defensive operations off the coast of Hawaii, during the course of which her planes sunk six ships, downed countless aircraft, and destroyed many ground facilities. But that was just the foundation of Enterprise's legend, and it would be the Battle of Midway that would cement it. This battle, fought almost entirely with aircraft between the 3rd and 6th of June 1942, saw the US Navy sink four of Japan's carriers, destroy 248 of its aircraft, and kill nearly all of its best trained naval pilots, completely ending the threat of further Japanese expansion in the Pacific. Enterprise's aircraft squadrons were instrumental in this victory, which proved to be 
a bloody hell for her as she sank the crews of Mikuma and many smaller destroyers entirely by herself. She disabled and set the carriers Kaga and Akagi ablaze and shot down at least 40 aircraft, both with her AA defenses and her aerial arm. For her troubles, she took quite the battering. Three direct bomb hits and four near misses, which killed 74 sailors, wounded 95 more, and inflicted serious damage on the carrier. But thanks to the sturdiness of her design and the stalwart bravery of her crew, she was patched up and returned back home to Hawaii under her own power. Come the 11th of November, Enterprise was fully repaired and ready to hit the waves again with highlights of her later service, including providing close air support to the 27th Infantry Division as they landed on Mac and Atoll, where her aircraft duly reduced Japanese fortified positions to rubble before the attack infantry stormed in and then doing the exact same thing on Jaluit Atoll, Majuro, and Espiruto Santo as other units attacked the islands. She would then go on to destroy over 40 aircraft in the 1944 Battle of the Philippine Sea, the largest ever carrier battle in history, and then go on to bomb Tokyo with the only carrier air contingent of the entire war trained in nighttime operations. Eventually, however, with the end of the war, Enterprise's time on this mortal plane was also nearing its end. An absolute unit, though she certainly was. She was, come the war's end, old, and it was apparent to all that her heavily upgraded but still fundamentally pre-war systems simply wouldn't be up to snuff in the jet age, and so she was decommissioned in 1947 and eventually scrapped in 1958. All that remains of her now is her stern plate, dumped in an anonymous suburb in New Jersey, the last remnant of not just the greatest carrier of World War II, but possibly the greatest carrier ever. From one Enterprise to another, let's now take a look at our previous chapter's younger sister. She was commissioned on the 25th of November 1961 and had one particular feature that earned her a place in this video. She was the world's first nuclear-powered carrier. Prior to her launch, various old-school engine types were the in-vogue method of getting carriers to go. Some were diesel-powered like HMS Audacity and others like USS Wasp were steam turbine-powered. These worked well enough and are still in fact used by cash-strapped powers such as the UK and Russia today, who use such engines in HMS Queen Elizabeth and Admiral Kuznetsov, respectively. But fine though they are, such engines have limitations, namely the need to stop and refuel every so often. When fitted to a ship that's whole shtick is being able to plonk itself anywhere in the world and launch aircraft, well, it's not ideal, is it? Nuclear propulsion fixed this problem, because Enterprise, with her eight nuclear reactors buried deep in her hull, only needed refueling once every 25 years. Beyond just her engine, Enterprise was also a bit of a unit, more generally too, because at 1,100 feet long, she was the single longest military ship ever built, and thanks to her displacement of 93,000 tons, she was one of the heaviest, being the third heaviest carrier ever put to sea behind her younger sisters, the Nimitz and Gerald R. Ford classes. And she put this space to good use too, being able to squeeze up to 90 aircraft and 4,500 crew in her belly. But cool as all of this is, and as brown as our underpants would be if she pulled up on our coastline, with hostile intent, she really was all about the nuclear power, and it's her pioneering of that technology above all else that has earned her a place in this video. The significance of such a propulsion system simply cannot be overstated. It marked a pivotal moment in naval warfare, proving the feasibility of the technology, and for the first time ever, meaning that no country could ever be out of range of the US Navy, even if the whole world turned against it. During her service, Enterprise played a crucial role in several Cold War confrontations and conflicts. Her first combat operation came during in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Fortunately, very fortunately in fact, given what was at stake, she never fired a single shot in anger during this deployment. But nonetheless, her newfangled nuclear reactor was immediately vindicated. While her steam-powered siblings would have to be rotated out of the blockade to go and refuel, she just sat there, circling, waiting, lingering, always ready at a moment's notice. Then it was off to Vietnam for Enterprise, where she had a much more active combat role, becoming the first nuclear-powered ship to engage in combat when its aircraft conducted airstrikes against Viet Cong targets in 1965. Throughout the conflict, her air wing flew thousands of sorties and delivered countless precision strikes against enemy positions and provided crucial support for ground troops. Beyond her combat exploits, Enterprise served as a key asset in projecting American naval power and diplomacy around the world. Her global deployments were a visible symbol of the the US's commitment to its foreign policy goals and a giant 93,000 ton reminder to America's enemies that they could be f***ed. 
fucked up real quick if they rattled their sabers too loudly. Whether navigating the Mediterranean to bolster NATO forces or steaming through the Pacific to counter Soviet influence in Asia, Enterprise was at the forefront of America's naval response to the geopolitical challenges of the era. But all good things must come to an end, and while Enterprise's legacy would live on with every later spawned nuclear carrier put to sea, a time came in 2017 when she was sold and cut up for scrap, having been deemed obsolete and mothballed from the fleet five years prior. She had a good innings, though, all things considered. There aren't many ships that last 51 years in active duty. So long-lived was she, in fact, that come the time of her disposal, there were only two other ships older than her still in commission. The Pueblo, the spy ship that the North Koreans nicked back in 1968 and that the US Navy refuses to accept as lost to save face, and the Constitution, and she's a 230-year-old wooden museum ship. Now, so far in this video, we've seen a carrier that was the most powerful because she was the first one, a carrier that was the most powerful because of her combat record, and a carrier that was the most powerful because of her groundbreaking propulsion system. And if we do say so ourselves, it was a rather big brain choice on our part, as it prevented this video from becoming a review of four nearly identical modern US supercarriers. But now, let's look at real power, i.e. the carrier with the greatest capacity to blow up. And for that, there's only one ship to consider, the USS Gerald R. Ford. Named in honor of the 38th President of the United States, Gerald R. Ford, who served the nation both as a president and in the Navy during World War II, ironically, aboard a carrier, the Ford isn't just a big ship. She is a manifestation of America's military might and geopolitical power. Launched in 2013 and commissioned in 2017, she is the lead ship of her namesake class, of which a total of 10 are currently planned to be built as the older Nimitz class is phased out. At the heart of her design is a focus on operational efficiency, survivability, and future adaptability. Introduced on her were a slew of advancements that redefined the capabilities of a carrier. An electromagnetic aircraft launch system replaces traditional steam catapults, offering more precise control, reduced stress on airframes, the ability to launch a wide variety of aircraft, including drones and heavier bombers, and the most important of all, less time between launches. There's no two ways about it. This is revolutionary, as it allows for a significantly higher sortie rate than any carrier that came before her, 240 a day compared to a mere 180 or so on the Nimitz. The design of the Ford also emphasizes stealth characteristics. This gives her a reduced radar cross-section, making her less detectable to enemies and thus enhancing her survivability in hostile environments. Although, we have to be honest, we have no idea how this works, because uh, would you believe it, the US Navy isn't willing to disclose its top-of-the-line stealth technology. And it's a shame, too, because given the fact that she isn't exactly the most slender of ships, we're pretty curious how they did that. But what truly sets the Ford apart and cements her status as the most powerful carrier in the world is a staggering array of firepower and onboard systems. Equipped with a nuclear propulsion system that can operate for over 20 years without refueling, this 100,000-ton monster of the seas can sustain prolonged deployments anywhere in the world. And as for her arsenal, that includes nothing but the latest and greatest in naval warfare technology, from advanced missile systems like the RIM-162 Evolved Sea Sparrow, which can blow a supersonic jet out of the sky from 27 miles away, to state-of-the-art defensive weapons like the Phalanx Close-In Weapon System, which can send 4,500 cannon rounds a minute downrange with pinpoint accuracy out to a mile, and with vague accuracy for five miles. So it's fair to say that this ship is an absolute unit. And we haven't even got to the main event yet, her air wing. She can fit 90 aircraft in her belly, among which could be anything from a Boeing FA-18E Super Hornet, the Navy's dependable multi-role fighter of 30 years experience, and its younger two-seat sibling, the EA-18G Growler, or top-of-the-line Lockheed Martin F-35s, which can blow basically any plane out of the sky before it even knows it's under fire. Helicopters get a look in too, as just for good measure, the Ford also carries a few Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawks. For odd jobs. All in all, it's not an exaggeration to say that not a single other carrier currently in commission holds a candle to the Ford. Her capabilities are simply that ridiculous. It won't stay that way for long, however, as next year she is due to be joined by her sister ship, the John F. Kennedy, and two further sisters, the Enterprise and Doris Miller, later down the line.